So we're talking tonight about the University of Toronto at Scarborough. I know that Maureen Sanchez talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, she got very into the details. I kind of want to pull back a little bit and just talk about how the architect, this is really from the architect's standpoint, how the architect has to fight for passive house from day one to day end the whole time. Maureen definitely talked about that and she is a fighter and thank God she's on the project. I'm just talking about from inception to when our scope ended, which was 100% DD. So a little bit about this project, actually, I'm showing the project team here a step back. This is our second time doing this project, actually. We did the project a first round in 2017 with IBI. We were a team. We submitted a design. It was too expensive. End of competition. Money lost. <laughs> Lots of effort. End. Then we go in the competition a second time. Second time we teamed up with Core Architects, with Stephen Winter, with Integral, with RWDI. We go in as another competition team. That one was in 2019. We ultimately win that competition, proving that we can do Passive House for the university. And then we go ahead with the documentation. So as I noted, Maureen comes in in the construction team, which is after our scope, which again, actually, Ironically, IBI comes in on the construction side as the architecture firm, and Palmer Lill is building the building right now. It's under construction. So architect needs to know their client, right? You need to understand who you're dealing with. And what's really interesting about UTSC is that they have instituted some very interesting sustainability and other innovative ideas on their campus. On the left, they use these massive earth tubes, which we find very, very interesting to um, temper incoming air for one of their science buildings. And on the right and the bottom here, this um, aquatic center, they did a very, very interesting, um, fully accessible pool. I, I'm just trying to say that UTSC, we know from the get-go that they are a forward-thinking university. They have a red tape, but they are a forward-thinking university. They also- Deborah, Deborah sorry to interrupt you. Um, we're getting a little bit of, we're getting like a rectangular vertical box on the uh, right-hand side of your slide there. Um, yeah. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. I think that no, was my- um, No worries. My Zoom. So then we also know that um, UTSC is a campus that's focused on health and wellness. So we want to use these two things to constantly be saying, hey, remember who you are, remember what's important. Even when times are getting rough throughout this process, you want a healthy building, you want a building that leads to the promotion of health, you want to be industry leaders in the uh, in sustainability. So know your client and remind your client what's important. Very big overview of the, the project. It sits in between what's called the North Campus and the South Campus. It will be a nine story, 270,000 square feet dormitory for um, incoming freshmen, 752 beds. And uh, the big component of this is the servery, which has been quite a challenge to um, prepare, for seven, uh, prepare the building for 1,700 meals per day. But um, SWA, our team, we laid the groundwork for figuring out how this can be achieved. And we're targeting PHI certification on the project. So very initially, when we're starting to get the project together, we're identifying for the client specific project challenges. We always want to attack the supply chain, look for our products, get our ducks in a row, be, be forward with the client about the supply chain problems, which are getting better, as we all know. Sorry, I'm just turning off my heat. Then we want to, of course, climate here in Toronto was definitely a, a, um, a project challenge that we needed to be aware of. Our other projects in New York and Boston are in a lower climate zone. The dining hall, as I noted, very high energy intensity has actually pushed up the overall allowable energy for the building because of the presence of the servery. And also 
lots of students living in very dense environments. So that also is going to get that source energy target a little bit higher. Then the last two are really important because the notion of passive house actually conflicted with the University of Toronto's own energy requirements. So there are some funny things within passive house that we had to really work hard to explain how they were better than 40% better than ASHRAE, for instance, or there was a couple of other things such as that. So sort of helping their sustainability department even understand passive house. We'll see how we did that throughout this presentation a little bit, how we tried to help them work through realizing that passive house was actually better than their own standards. Because, you know, these guys work very hard on their own standards, right? So we have to be respectful of that. And then um, and the project needed to meet Toronto, well, Toronto Green Standards Tier 3 was sort of, which is kind of a lead gold, is where the project kind of started. It had to at least be that. So we had to constantly be explaining how we met that and how we sort of overlapped that and then how we exceeded that. So I'm going to show you now how we complied. So and actually, what's interesting is that these diagrams are almost exactly the same as in our RFP response. So we really spent almost six months proving that this could work, that we could afford this, that we could do this. But this is very similar to our RFP response, actually. We are looking here at a building section. This is all stick built on site. We're going to have a rain screen metal panel inboard insulation, some waterproofing, some more insulation, and a vapor barrier. We're going to have UPVC windows with triple glazing. Essentially, these are the components that we laid out at the very beginning of the project and spent the effort to continue to prove that this wall assembly, that we could afford it, and that it was um, the proper way to go. And then our heating and cooling system, very straightforward. We're using a VRF system. We're putting those condensers up on the roof. The, VR, the refrigerant is just going to run straight down and hit the units below. It's only nine stories, very handy. You can just put those condensers up on the roof. And then we're going to push the heating and the cooling out through the ceiling mounted units. Very simple system. Ventilation, they had to sort of understand, okay, we're going to be bringing in fresh air. We're going to distribute that fresh air within the room, and then we're going to exhaust, as typical, all of the exhaust air. However, of course, we're going to be using an ERV to pull the heat off of that exhaust air and then temper that incoming fresh air. So that's it. Enclosure mechanical system, right? Very simple. But as we all know, it's not quite that simple, but that, that was the groundwork for the project. So this is the moment where we want to really talk about a little bit about our um, how we need to speak to the stakeholders of the project. Now, Lois, we all know Lois. We love Lois. I hope she's on. I don't know if she is. But between Lois and her, um, Thomas Moore work, uh, working at SWA, the two of them have helped us to create a narrative and to solve the problems initially of this project. And just incredible communicators and incredibly supportive to the architects. Very, very important. Um, Lois and I spent hours talking. We, we lectured. Actually, this is um, a, a picture here that the University of Toronto actually had the Canadian conference, Passive House Conference. And um, Lois and I were able to speak there, um, both on behalf of, of our project and also to share our other projects. But it was a really great moment for us to, to be able to share the project after about a year and a half of working on it. So we're talking to the stakeholders. We're telling everybody that the sustainability group, as I mentioned, the campus facility folks and the financial people, we're, we're working with them to, to explain the different aspects of Passive House. 
we're making sure that the owner understands even the process of passive house, right? We have our triad as usual, but then we want to make sure that the the owner always understands these particular consultants that are affected by passive house, and then really want to help them specifically with this passive house certifier step. It adds cost and another step. So all of this, this sort of very, um, what seems obvious to some of us, but maybe not all of us on this call, we want to make sure that the owner understands the trajectory to get to passive house. So as I noted, there was a tier three, which is kind of lead gold, and then there's passive house. And this is one of the exercises, and I'll be showing you now a few exercises we went through to sort of prove out passive house. So what we're showing you here is kind of a Venn diagram that uh, tier three is quite aggressive. So we wanted to identify all of the ac actual components that are the same. So let's not pretend that tier three doesn't, uh, require energy recovery, for instance. It's not a unique thing to Passive House. It is required by Tier 3. So we go through a list here, making sure that everyone understands. And look at this even, the last thing of Tier 3, fresh air ventilation to each habitable room. Right. So it sort of took some of the mystery or some of the black holeness out of Passive House when they started to realize, oh, well, look at that. It's not that different. We understand this a little bit better now. We're showing them here on the right how those U values, R values are going to be a little bit higher and lower. And then we're also talking about the taping and the thermal break analysis, which of course is quite intense in our passive house projects. We're gonna make sure that the clients understand that facade selection, window selection, HVAC, they all have schedule, cost, aesthetic, performance, lots. There's a lot of factors that we want to make sure very early on we are reminding them of the different trade-offs. And then we want to work on with them on the facade selection. All right, we, we want to show them other options. Ultimately, we end up at our original option, but we need to sort of work through with them when they ask questions on the left here is the, the house of Cornell Tech, which is a mega panel system. So this system is a little bit more expensive than a stick built system, but it has its attributes. So we talked through with them those attributes. We looked at in the center here, the stick built system at Sendero Verde, a brick system that has its attributes. And then on the right, this curtain wall system. So we wanna go through make sure the client understands the trade-offs and the, the differences between the different types of systems. We've actually had very good um, pricing and um, constructability uh, targets met with the stick build system. So then we're asked, well, VRF seems very expensive. You know, they're always like, VRF is too expensive. So we did a study that I find extremely interesting which here shows our project. And then they had the two compar comparable in quotes, right? Because there's a little smaller. So we have to look at the study with a grain of salt. However, when we look at the difference at the bottom of the chart here, air-cooled VRF versus four pipe fan coil versus two pipe. And these final numbers are actually not that different and passive house VRF system comes in lower. So this to us was an, a really very, it was a great moment for our discussion of VRF being viable for the project and really helped us to get over a hump of, of course, because right away when the project's over budget, get rid of the VRF, get rid of this, get rid of that. And we have to constantly be showing them it, it's viable. This, this uh, chart is prepared by SWA. They're, they also are helping us to bolster um, the arguments at all times. So we're comparing here pH versus tier T3. Of course, it's more, a little bit more expensive. We estimated at two and a half percent actually um, more expensive, but all of the pros start to outweigh the con and the owner starts to get more comfortable with the cost. 
And then there's just two more slides here. This slide showing how utility costs have changed from business as usual to the 2020 passive house and how greenhouse gas emissions will change from business as usual to the passive house project. So we also illustrated this for them. And we illustrated at the end of DD, the, the payback expected and the tons of um, greenhouse gas emissions as well. So these numbers combined with amazingly intense value engineering exercises, we did end up taking out about $1.5 million of the project to pay for this 1.5 million, but we kept, we held on to the passive house. And we owe that so much, you know, to Andrew Afuz Afuzman, who is running the project for UTSC. We owe thanks to like Rob Bernhardt, who helped us sell, keep this project on target from the Passive House Canada Institute. And to really everybody for just pushing so hard and staying so focused and being so committed to making this project happen. And now it's under construction. Mm -hmm.